I'm glad Lamar led that uh, upbeat and encouraging song because uh, after my sermon today, you're probably not going to feel that way. That's a great way for a preacher to start a sermon, right? But it's because of what we're going to be looking at today, but there is a silver lining. There's a light at the end of the tunnel, so hopefully uh, by the time we're done, we will feel uh, as upbeat as we do right now. If you've got your Bibles open to the book of Jeremiah, we're going to be all over the book of Jeremiah this morning. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, follow along. Of course, I'll have the scriptures up on the screen. But I want to start with a question. Have you ever felt like giving up? Just quitting? Wow, nobody. All right, well, I, okay, all right. Thank you, Bob, for being honest. Okay. If I think if we're all honest, a lot of our hands would go up. And it doesn't necessarily have to be that you've considered you know, ending your life or anything like that. But just you get so tired of certain things. Maybe it's a certain project that you're working on at work or maybe even at home. Maybe it's even something you enjoy doing. Maybe putting a puzzle together, something like that. And it's one of those, you know, 10,000 piece puzzles. And, and, and you just can't tell where, you know, some of them are, where they go. And you just feel like quitting, just giving up. Or maybe it's a relationship that you've worked on for a very long time, maybe with a, a spouse or significant other or a child or parent or a sibling or, or whoever it is. And at some point you just feel like it's going nowhere, that there, you can't do anything else with it, and, and you're just ready to quit. You're ready to give up. Maybe it's the ministry that God has called you to do because we're all called to be ministers. You don't have to stand up here with a coat and tie on Sunday and preach to be a minister. We're all ministers. We're all servants of God. <clears throat> and there may be times in your life where you feel like just giving up whatever work it is God has called you to do. You just can't go on. You've had all you can take. You just feel like crying. You just feel like putting your head in your hands. You just feel like, as I said in Bible class this morning, crawling under the pew or under your bed and just kind of quivering there. Because you just can't take it anymore. I want us to look at the story of Jeremiah this morning. Because Jeremiah is a man who I am sure, and we'll see from Scripture here, felt like quitting. He felt like giving up many times in his life. And I picked out this picture. This is obviously an artist's representation of Jeremiah. I don't think Jeremiah was some old white European guy, okay? But I like this picture because I think it conveys the sense of sadness, the sense of loneliness, the sense of despair, the sense of just ready to throw in the towel that Jeremiah had in his service to God. We're going to look at his story this morning, and I think that you'll see some things that you can identify with, but again, I'm not going to leave you on a sour note. There's some lessons I think we can learn on what to do when we feel like giving up. But first, a little bit of background, okay? You recall that the kingdom of Israel split after the death of Solomon into the northern kingdom that was called Israel and the southern kingdom called Judah. Several hundred years passed. They had a bunch of different kings in each kingdom. Israel was pretty much a, a wicked kingdom. They didn't really have any good kings at all. Uh, and they were eventually carried off into Assyrian captivity, never to return as a nation. Here's the, the kingdom of Assyria. So they came in and they took over the northern kingdom of Israel. A little while later, Babylon was going to come in and take over Judah. Again, as God's punishment for their repeated sins, their repeated, um, as, as the Bible describes it, we'll look at this morning, adultery in their relationship with God. Okay? And Jeremiah was called as a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah from around 625 to 586 B.C., for about 40 years. So here you see the kings of Judah. Here are the prophets that were sent to Judah. And Jeremiah is right here. About 40 years he prophesied. Now, he was called to prophesy by God as a relatively young man. We don't know exactly how old he was. But he was unmarried. We know that. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Okay? So he's probably a relatively young man. So let's just assume he was called around maybe age 20. Maybe even younger he was called. For 40 years. So if he's called at age 20, up until the time he's 60 years old, he's prophesying to Judah. And his message was not a pleasant one. As we'll see in a moment, it was a message that nobody wanted to hear. And really it was a message that Jeremiah didn't want to preach. Again, we'll come back to that in just a moment. But his main message was a warning concerning the coming judgment in the form of siege by and deportation to Babylon. Here's a representation of the kingdom of Babylon. We know that that eventually happened in 586 B.C. 
Babylon came in, Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem, killed tens of thousands, carried off tens of thousands more into captivity. That's when Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were carried off into captivity. They were kept in captivity for around 70 years before a remnant was allowed to return to the land. And what Jeremiah did in his preaching was he used the example of the northern kingdom of Israel and what happened to them with Assyria to try to get the southern kingdom of Judah to repent. And he kept pointing it out. Look at what happened to Israel. Look at what they did and what God did to them. You've got to repent. You've got to turn. Now you can imagine it was a tough assignment that Jeremiah had. And there are a lot of reasons, and we're going to look at some this morning, why Jeremiah, I think, wanted to quit. Why he wanted to throw in the towel, why he just wanted to give up, why he had had enough, and he wanted to kind of crawl under his bed and say, I'm done. I can't deal with it anymore. I can't take it. Let's look at some of those reasons very briefly. Number one, it was the people that Jeremiah had to preach to. You don't have to raise your hand. But if people ever made you want to quit something, and maybe not the people themselves, but maybe their actions or their attitudes, again, in relationships, in ministry, in life in general, people can be difficult. Now again, Jeremiah was hoping that Judah would learn from what happened to Israel, but I picked this picture right here because this was basically Judah's reaction. They covered up their ears. They didn't want to hear it. They don't want to hear anything Jeremiah had to say because his message was not a positive one. Let's look first at Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. I'm going to use the Holman Christian Standard Translation just for this one passage because I like the way it reads. Jeremiah writes, I observed that it was because unfaithful Israel had committed adultery, and, and that's being used in a figurative sense there, that I had sent her away and had given her a certificate of divorce. This is God speaking, okay? So the illustration he uses here is like a marriage covenant. God had a covenant relationship with his people, but Israel had treated it like, like an adulteress treats her marriage. Okay? And so God had, in a symbolic sense, written them a certificate of divorce. He had put them away and allowed them to be carried off into captivity. Nevertheless, her treacherous sister Judah, the southern kingdom, the people that Jeremiah is speaking to, was not afraid. She defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. Those were the different idols that they worshipped, made out of wood and stone. Yet in spite of all of this, her treacherous sister Judah didn't return to me with all her heart, only in pretense. And the Lord said to me, Faithless Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. You see the picture Jeremiah is painting here? The people of Judah pretended to come back to God in pretense there. They came to the worship services. They sang the songs. They lifted their hands. They even filled in Jeremiah's sermon outline, so to speak. But it wasn't real. They worshiped with their lips, but their hearts were far from God. And God says through Jeremiah there, Israel was kind of more honest than Judah was. Because at least Israel never tried to pretend that they were still following God, yet Judah did. We also see in Jeremiah 7, verses 9 through 11, where God says, Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered, only to go on doing all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. They were being hypocritical. They were following after all these false gods and then still coming and standing in the temple and worshiping God and saying, Oh, how I love God! And going after these idols. And God said, I see it. You can't fool me. I know what's going on. These were the people Jeremiah was trying to reach with his message. God's people can sometimes be some of the most hypocritical people that you'll ever meet. Because on one hand, they're claiming that they serve God, that they love everybody, that they're trying to, to live righteously, and then we see them, on the other hand, going off and doing just what Judah was doing here. They can be some of the most hypocritical. They can be some of the most difficult people to work with. I'm going to share something with y'all that not a lot of preachers would share with you, okay? There was one time I was working at a church, not this church, okay? I was working at a church 
they made me quit. And I don't mean that they forced me to resign. I just had had enough. And I was like, you know what? I can't do this anymore. I can't take this. I can't deal with this. Uh, the attitudes, the, the, the way that people were acting, I said, I resigned. That's when I went back to culinary school. And for about eight years, I stayed out of ministry as my occupation. Now, I'll be honest, I was not, never tempted to leave God, but I was sure ready to be done with God's people, at least for a little while, at least that group of them. Because sometimes we can be very difficult people, and I include myself in that number. And so I think Jeremiah just got tired of dealing with the people. Number two, Jeremiah got tired of the work that God had called him to do. I mentioned before, Jeremiah's message was not very positive. He had a tough job. It was to preach a difficult message that no one wanted to hear. And that message was basically this. God is angry with you, and he's about to unleash judgment on you because of your sins. Wow, what a great message, right? How many of y'all like to hear that week in and week out? Yeah, I better not see any hands go up there. Okay. You read in 2 Chronicles, which is a historical account of the children of Israel and, 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 and their history there. We read there, the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place, the temple. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people until there was no remedy. By the time Jeremiah arrives on the scene, God is like, I'm done. I'm done with you people. I'm tired of your wishy-washiness. I'm tired of y'all turning your backs on me. I'm tired of you being adulteresses, as he used that descriptive term there. And he said, the judgment's coming. And so Jeremiah's message was not one of repent so that God will relent his judgment. Jeremiah's message was, it's coming and you better get ready for it. Basically, Jeremiah preached a 40-year sermon series called Captivity and Death. How'd you like to preach that one, Lamar? For 40 years, he preached captivity and death. I can imagine the pews were pretty empty on Sunday, probably after about year one, but I'm sure by year 40, there wasn't hardly anyone listening to Jeremiah's message. And another part of his message was that their only hope in all this was to surrender to Babylon and that things would go reasonably well. Now, can you imagine if a preacher stood up and said, hey, this judgment's coming, you're about to be carried off into captivity, the best thing you can do is just go ahead and surrender, deal with it, and then God's got a plan. But if they didn't surrender, the city, the temple would be burned, there would be famine, and tens of thousands would die by the sword. And as I mentioned earlier, tens of thousands would be carried off into captivity. And we know what happened, right? They chose the second option. They chose not to surrender. I mean, they eventually did, but they chose to try to fight. And of course, Nebuchadnezzar besieged the city. There was famine to the point where, and this is really, this is bad, y'all, but women were eating their own children because there was no food in the city. That's how bad it got. And that was the punishment that God sent on people. And you can imagine that preaching that message over and over and over again to a people who wouldn't listen to it wore Jeremiah out. I mean, he was, you, you can imagine. He's just tired. He's worn out. Look at what he says in Jeremiah 23, 9, concerning the prophets. My heart is broken within me. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man, like a man overcome by wine because of the Lord and because of his holy words. Jeremiah said, my heart is weak. My bones shake. I, I'm, I'm, I'm wobbling around like a drunk man. I'm just so exhausted from this message that I've got to preach. We can see why Jeremiah would want to give up. A third reason Jeremiah might have wanted to give up was because of rejection and futility. The people rejected that message, and who can blame them? I mean, we probably would reject that message too, wouldn't we? Who wants to hear doom and gloom all the time? Jeremiah 6, verses 16 through 17. Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look. And ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they, the people of Judah, said, we will not walk in it. I set watchmen over you saying, pay attention to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not pay attention. Jeremiah's message was rejected over and over and over again. Every time he preached it, when he said, look to the Lord, 
God, God has set these things up for you. He said, nope, we don't want any part of it. And not only did Jeremiah experience rejection from the people, believe it or not, Jeremiah experienced a type of rejection from God. Not that God rejected Jeremiah as a person, but if you look at Jeremiah chapter 11 and verse 14, God rejected his prayers for the nation. God says, therefore, do not pray for this people or lift up a cry or prayer on their behalf, for I will not listen when they call to me in the time of their trouble. As I mentioned before, God had had it. His patience was done. It was the straw that broke the camel's back, and he said, the judgment's coming. So Jeremiah, don't pray for these people. And we know that he did. He's known as the weeping prophet. I'll put that verse up here in a minute. One of the reasons he's known as the weeping prophet is not because of, of just this horrible message he had to preach, but he's crying for his people. The people that he's trying to minister to, knowing that they're not listening, knowing that God's not going to relent, knowing what's coming, and he's upset. And so he experienced even that rejection from God. God said, don't pray for him, Jeremiah. Don't do it. Constant rejection is enough to make anyone want to quit. I'm going to pick on James here for just a moment. James is a published author, in case you didn't know. One of the things that authors have to deal with is rejection. When they've got a completed manuscript or completed work and they begin sending it to publishers, that's about the only way they can do it unless they self-publish, is they just send it to different publishers. And so many authors get those rejection letters over and over and over again. And so many authors just give up. They quit writing. They quit submitting those manuscripts because they keep getting rejected. You can understand that. It's enough to make anyone want to quit when you're constantly told no and you're constantly rejected. Jeremiah was rejected not only by the people, but in a sense, to a certain extent, by God, saying, don't pray for them. Rejection is enough to make anybody want to quit. I believe that also Jeremiah experienced some loneliness. Here's a man who really could have used a sympathetic spouse and family, but when God first called him, he told Jeremiah, Jeremiah, don't get married. In Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, the word of the Lord came to me, you shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place. Wow, God, that seems really harsh. <laughs> You're going to call this man to prophesy for you, to give this message of doom and gloom, and you're not even going to give him a support system? No wife, no kids, no family? Why, God? Well, if you keep reading in verses 3 through 7, it pretty much says because they were likely to die, Jeremiah would want to mourn them and be comforted, and God said there's not going to be any comfort. There's not going to be any comfort for those who mourn in Judah. In fact, he goes on to tell Jeremiah not to attend any social gatherings. Verses uh, 8 and 9 of that same passage, Jeremiah chapter 16, he says, You shall not go into the house of feasting to sit with them to eat and drink. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will silence in this place before your eyes and in your days the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. So God said, don't get married, don't take a wife, don't have any kids because they're likely to die and you're not going to be able to mourn them. And in fact, Jeremiah, don't even have any social gatherings with anybody because I'm done with these people. I don't want them celebrating. I don't want you celebrating. I don't want the, the people who are mourning to receive any comfort because I'm done. How many of y'all would have liked to have been Jeremiah? Man, this guy had it rough. No wonder he wanted to quit. But you know what? That's not all. It got even worse for Jeremiah. And again, you look at this picture and you see a man who's just done the hardships he experienced. I'm going to share just a few of them that are recounted in his book there. Men from his own hometown plotted against him because of the message he was preaching. That's in chapter 11, verse 9 and following. He's put on trial for his very life, again, because of the message he's preaching. That's in chapter 26 and verse 11. The first draft of what we have is the book here. His prophecies was cut up and burned by the king when it was delivered to him. That's in count, uh, uh, chapter 36. That's the picture right there. That's when he took the penknife and his sections were read. The king would just cut the scroll, throw it in the fire. That's what he thought of Jeremiah's message. That's what everybody else thought about it too. He was flogged and put in public stocks for people to mock, chapter 20 and verse 1. He was attacked by false prophets who were speaking a positive message. Oh no, God's not going to punish us. Jeremiah was the lone descent. And they're like, okay, we're, we're, we're not going to have this, Jeremiah. He was attacked by them. He was arrested and accused of treason, chapter 37 and verse 11. 
And in one of the most famous stories, he was dragged from his prison cell, lowered by ropes into an empty well in the prison yard. There was no water in it in that cistern, but there was a thick layer of mud and muck, and Jeremiah sunk down deep into it and was left there for a while. Now, can you imagine going through all of that because you're doing what God told you to do, you're preaching a message of doom and gloom that no one wants to hear, that everyone's rejecting. You're not allowed any kind of support system other than God, which is really the only support system we need, but no physical support system there. And then all these things happen to you, and then you're finally lowered down into this muck, and we don't know how, how deep he sank, but you know, maybe waist high. Can you imagine mud and slime? Have you ever seen uh, like a bird bath that's just got all that green, nasty junk growing in it? Or, or you know, uh, just, just, just picture that. And you're lowered down into that because you're preaching God's Word. Again, no wonder he wanted to quit. No wonder he's known as the weeping prophet. Jeremiah 9.1 Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Again, those tears were not necessarily for himself, but for his people. But who could blame Jeremiah if he did shed a tear or two for his own predicament? I think every single one of us would have done so as well. Jeremiah felt like quitting multiple times in his ministry. Two passages I want to share with you. Jeremiah's own words. Jeremiah 15, verses 15 through 18. O Lord, you know. Remember me and visit me. And take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your forbearance, take me not away. Know that for your sake I bear reproach. Your words were found and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. I did not sit in the company of revelers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone because your hand was upon me, for you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Will you be to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail? Notice that last verse there. Why is my pain unceasing, my wound uncurable? And that phrase there, will you be like to me a deceitful brook like waters that fail? He's, he's describing here these seasonal streams. And he's talking about a man who goes to this stream expecting water and there's nothing there. He's like, God, are you going to be like that with me? I'm going to you for, for some comfort, for some strength, and I'm not finding it, Lord. This wound that I've got, this message that I'm preaching, these people that I'm trying to reach, it won't be healed. I can't take it anymore, God. Jeremiah 20, 14 through 18. Cursed be the day on which I was born, the day when my mother bore me. Let it not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father. A son is born to you, making him very glad. Let that man be like the cities that the Lord overthrew without pity. Let him hear a cry in the morning and an alarm at noon, because he did not kill me in the womb. So my mother would have been my grave and her womb forever great. Why did I come out from the womb and see toil and sorrow and spend my days in shame? You see what Jeremiah is saying right there? He's saying, why was I even born? If I have to endure all this, Lord, if this is the life you've chosen for me, if I've got to preach this message, if I've got to tell these people that they're going to die, that they're going to be overrun, Lord, why was I even born? Again, don't raise your hands, but you ever felt like that before? You ever question God? God, why would you even put me here? Why was I born? I think a lot of us may have felt that way at times. These are the words of a man who is ready to quit, who just can't take it anymore. But, and here's the silver lining, and here's the lesson that we can learn, because I'm sure a lot of us have felt like Jeremiah at times. Whether it be in our relationships, whether it be in the ministry God has called us to do, we have felt like quitting because we feel like no one's listening. The message that we've got to bring, no one's paying attention to it. It's not a pleasant message sometimes. No one likes to tell people that they've got sin in their lives. But that's a message, part of the message that we bring. That people are lost and they're dying. They've got sin, they need to repent. But Jeremiah kept going. He didn't quit when he felt like it. How? How in the world for 40 years did Jeremiah keep on keeping on? Well, I think there were three things, and these are the three things that we can take to keep us going when we feel like quitting. Number one, 
He had a purpose to live for. I'm going to quote from Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. Just a short quote here, but it's very appropriate. He writes, nothing matters more than knowing God's purposes for your life. And nothing can compensate for not knowing them. Not success, wealth, fame, or pleasure. Without a purpose, life is motion without meaning. Activity without direction and events without reason. Without a purpose, life is trivial, petty, and pointless. When life has meaning, you can bear almost anything. Without meaning, nothing is bearable. Jeremiah learned that. He learned that he had a purpose in his life. In Jeremiah chapter 1, the very beginning of his book here, verses 4 through 8, Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, and this is God speaking to Jeremiah, listen, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Notice, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. God basically told Jeremiah, I've got a purpose for you. Before you even born, Jeremiah, when you were still in your mother's womb, that womb that you would later on curse, the day that you were born, I had a plan for you, Jeremiah. And that's why I noted verse 8. God told Jeremiah, I'm with you. He may have felt alone at times. <clears throat> he may not have had a wife or a family to support him. The entire nation may have rejected him, but Jeremiah was never alone. And we are never alone as long as we have God in our lives. That purpose helped Jeremiah keep going even when he felt like giving up. Look at what he writes in chapter 20, verses 7 through 9. Oh Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all the day. Everyone mocks me, for whenever I speak, I cry out, I shout, violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and a derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart as it were a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. Jeremiah says whenever he wanted to stop preaching the message, whenever he wanted to stop that message of doom and gloom, he couldn't. And I don't think he means in a miraculous sense either that he just he couldn't help himself. I think he realized the message that he had was that important. And it was a message people needed to hear, even if they didn't want to hear it. And he said, even when I wanted to stop, I couldn't. I couldn't hold it in. He had a purpose. And he knew what his purpose was. It was to give that message that God had given him. The second thing that kept Jeremiah going is that he had hope. He had hope. A number of years ago, some researchers performed an experiment to see the effect that hope has on those who are undergoing hardship. Two sets of laboratory rats were placed in separate tubs of water. The researchers left one set in the water and found that within an hour, all the rats had drowned. The rats in the other tub, however, were periodically lifted out of the water and then put back in. When that happened, the second set of rats swam for over 24 hours. Why? Not because they were given a rest, but because they suddenly had hope. You see, those animals believed that if they could stay afloat just a little bit longer, someone would reach down and rescue them. Jeremiah had that hope. He may have felt like a drowning rat at times, but he had hope in God that God would rescue him. Look at what he writes in Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 11. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. This is a very famous verse here. It's a verse we have up on the refrigerator and mirrors in our house. Verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. There was a silver lining in Jeremiah's message. Not if you repent, God will spare you. No, the judgment's coming. You're going to be carried off into captivity. This famine and this war and this besiegement, it's coming. But if you'll stay faithful to God, even through all that, God's got a plan. He's going to bring you home eventually. He's going to restore Israel. He's going to allow them to return home. That's the message. God had a plan. Plans for welfare and not for evil. Plans to give them a future and a hope. 
Jeremiah knew the wars, the destruction, the famine, the captivity were not God's ultimate end for his people. Look at what he writes in the next two verses, verses 13 and 14. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Do you see the promise there? Do you see why Jeremiah could have hope for not only himself, but for God's people? Because God made a promise. He would eventually bring them back. They weren't going to stay in Babylonian captivity for forever. I'm going to put a quote up here. It's not a Bible verse. I've still got it in the white text on the black background. But I wanted, I wanted to put it that way because it's important. Okay? And it is this. God does not punish us or allow bad things to happen to us in order to pay us back, but to bring us back. Now read it again. God does not punish us or allow bad things to happen to us in order to pay us back, but to bring us back. God punished the nation of Judah not because He wanted revenge on them, because He wanted them to repent. He wanted them to come back. And He realized at a certain point that was what it was going to take. That punishment was all that was going to be, what was going to be necessary to finally wake them up and bring them back. But God doesn't punish us in order to pay us back, but to bring us back. And so as Jeremiah is leaving the burning city, as the temple is in ruins, as the entire city is on fire, he writes these words in Lamentations, which he also wrote, chapter 3, verses 19 through 26. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. I'm not going to be able to read this without singing it, y'all. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the soul who seeks Him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Sound familiar, Bible class? Again, he's writing that as he's leaving the city, as it's lying in ruins, as the smoke is going up into the sky. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. He had a hope that God would fulfill his promise to bring them back. And that's why he could write those words. And then thirdly and finally, he had a mighty God to trust in. Two passages that he wrote. Let's look here real quick. Jeremiah 32, verses 17 through 20. Ah, Lord God... It is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show steadfast love to thousands, but you repay the guilt of fathers to their children after them. O great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts, great in counsel and mighty in deed, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the children of man, rewarding each one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. You have shown signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, and to this day in Israel and among all mankind, and have made a name for yourself at this day. I think Jeremiah believed God was a mighty God. Better believe it. And then in Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 8, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Jeremiah knew he served a mighty God and he could be like that tree planted by that water having his roots in the Almighty God. As Christians, we too have a purpose that God has given us. It's found in Ephesians chapter 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You want to know what your purpose is as a Christian? It's to do good works. Those works include spreading the gospel message, 
doing good for others, helping those who are in need, encouraging your brothers and sisters. That's the purpose that you have as a Christian. That's the purpose God has given us. We also, like Jeremiah, have a hope. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 18 through 20. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Notice that. We have a hope that is set before us. What is that hope? That Jesus has gone on before us, that as he told his apostles, he's gone to prepare a place for us, and if he goes to prepare a place for us, he will surely come again and take us there. That's our hope. Our hope is that this world is not our home. That we are just passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. We know we have a home in heaven waiting for us. That's our hope. That's what gets us through those times when we just want to throw in the towel. And then finally, like Jeremiah, we have a mighty God to trust in. Look at the words of Paul in Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. We're having a hard time? Go to God. He can support us. He will support us. Feel like throwing in the towel? Go to God. He'll be there for you. There are times when you may feel like Jeremiah. You may feel like giving up. You may feel like giving up the people you're trying to minister to. You feel like giving up the message you have to share. Maybe you feel rejected. You're lonely. You're facing hardship. Jeremiah's been there. He's done that. He can empathize with you. He understands. And yet he didn't quit. And neither should you. Because we have a purpose. We have a hope. We have a mighty God. And it's all because of the empty tomb on that Sunday morning. When Jesus rose, when he conquered death, when he conquered Satan, and several days later would ascend back into heaven, going to prepare that place for us, we can have that hope. So I encourage you this morning, if you feel like giving up, if you feel like throwing in the towel, don't. It's okay to feel that way. I think it's human nature. But don't give in to it. Learn from the lessons of Jeremiah. Learn that we have a hope. We serve a mighty God. And we have a purpose for Him. This morning, if you need to respond to the invitation in any way, if you need to become a Christian, if you've done that in the past, if you've wandered away, if you've started feeling like giving up, I encourage you, don't do it. Come forward this morning for prayers, for strength, and for encouragement. Whatever your need would be, we invite you to come and respond. Together we stand and sing.